Hey folks, it's Alvin Angel. Welcome back to The Sim and welcome to post update 5, I think it is. The Xbox update, of course, we've all been waiting for. Now, not only has this made actually a big performance improvement for myself in The Sim, I've gained 30 to 40 percent in terms of my frames and overall performance, making more places way more accessible. But this brings in one of my favorite things new effects, including water effects for float planes. We've got snow for ski planes, and we have, of course, dirt for off airport stuff which is amazing now of course things still float when you first load in which is hilarious but i figured i'd take this opportunity to go through seaplane operations because this is something that a lot of people just kind of pick up as they go a lot of people could be flying seaplanes in the new sim or the sim now that they have them and we have of course the 172 on floats which are amphibious floats they have landing gear inside the wheels in fact we'll take a look at that just now I'm going to cover some very basic parts for you. Now, we look at the aircraft here. Now, this same thing applies to the Cub Crafters Cub X that's in the Sim 2. Now, at the back here, we have the water rudders. These are in a stowed position right now. I believe they're stowed. Let's just go inside and take a look, shall we? Let's make sure they're in the correct position right now. Okay, that'll be down. I love how there's next to no difference. Thank you. A sobo. Okay, so those are the water rudders which don't animate. Good start, a sobo. Just like when you introduced uh, the Icon A5 with no water effects. Water rudders typically retracted. They won't allow you to actually get any steering, but they'll be out of the water flow, so your rudder inputs can't actually suddenly slew the aircraft round on takeoff and throw you and possibly roll the aircraft. These allow you to steer on water. Now. Under here, the remain landing gear, and here are retractable nose wheels. These are not as strong as regular landing gear, so you'll find if you're landing on an airport or a grass field or even something rougher, you need to be incredibly careful. They are not that strong. But overall, the floats on this aircraft allow you to land on the surface of, of water bodies. We're here at Green Lake, which is in Whistler, British Columbia, and we're going to take you out for a little flight and kind of go over some basics of operating this kind of aircraft. So let's go back inside now. Our startup procedure is very, very similar. Now, you'll often see in float planes that braces here, which help to kind of brace against structural deformity, which can, from impacts of waves and water, could possibly, you know, squash things a little bit, maybe actually deform it enough to break the windshield or damage the aircraft. So it's extra structural reinforcement. Now, we're just going to quickly start up. So our beacon's on. Battery's on. Looking good so far of course they've changed all the new tool tips fuel pumps on that's good to go fuel valves in we're going to right tank here now one of the things you'll notice is you don't have a uh, you'll put a little throttle in of course to start the aircraft but you don't actually have a parking brake so you'll still be tied to the dock in theory when you are actually starting a float plane or you'll have actually pushed off either way you don't want to be facing a direction where you can't actually get around so something we'll deal with in the sim we'll use the pushback feature to compensate for that okay starting prop and we're good now you'll see we're moving a little bit because of the effect let's get everything turned on here Charlie, Whiskey, Alpha, Echo, traffic, Cessna, November, shush Oh, apparently it's telling it to, it's launching me for me. Okay, that's not something I expected. Fuel pumps off there. So we'll use the pushback feature really quickly just to kind of get us out of the way of the dock here because we're right in next to land. It'll give us some room to maneuver. So what we're going to want to do is put our water rudders down initially, which gives us that ability to turn. And we should have enough room in a moment. Now, again, we'd turn the aircraft around on the dock and be facing outbound or when in a position where we could actually maneuver away under our own power. So we'll do that just now. Water rudders have been applied, so do it a bit of power. More speed, more maneuverability. It's like a boat. The slower they are, uh, yeah. You're dealing with very small rudders in this aircraft. So we've got runway 23 and 05 to deal with here. So. We're going to go off on 05, and I'll talk you through a takeoff now. First thing you're going to do with a seaplane takeoff is you're going to push forward a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of motor around here. When you're maneuvering in a seaplane, you'll keep the off yokes backwards. What this does is, as I'm going to maneuver here, gorgeous wake effects, it helps to lift the nose, so we keep the tips of the floats out of the water. 
So let's get ourselves turned around here. Onto our heading for departure, which should be out that way onto the lake. Nice and easy. And once we are, I'll retract water rudders and we'll just ease along a little bit. So, 05, here we go. Okay, so let's throttle back a little bit for a moment. We'll pull the water rudders up. We've got our flaps set for departure. So we're going to throttle up and go. So initially I'll pull back just to help keep the tips of the floats out of the water. And then I'm going to push forwards. What this does is you'll notice when we saw the floats earlier, they had like a stepped effect on them. So just initially until we get a little bit of resistance, I'm going to do that. And then I'm just going to hold it straight. And <sighs> the water physics are not ideal in 2020 so far. They're actually really, really raggedy. For some reason you hop and skip as you break water contact. It's not an accurate simulation of how it would behave, but as we look around to the aircraft here, you'll notice this section here. That is the step. What we're doing by pushing forwards on initial takeoff is getting this part out of the water. That allows the aircraft to actually, as we are actually stall exactly there, uh, allows the smaller contact points. So water's got suction. It will hold the aircraft in there because it's holding onto a large part of the float. That step allows you to basically get a smaller contact area in the water than the aircraft needs to float. You need a lot of float to actually stay afloat and stay upright, but when you actually do get up on that step, same reason why hydrofoils and other boats that are very high speed boats, you'll notice have a step in the hull. Uh, it allows them to reduce contact area. Stop talking for me. Okay, so we're just gonna climb up a little bit here. Gorgeous area around Green Lake in Whistler. Yes, thank you. Gear is up for water landing. Now, this is a bit of a dog at the moment because it's a standard 172. Would you be quiet? And you can be quiet. Shut up. Okay, so we're going to land the same where we took off a minute ago. So we're going to come down with... I know! Thank you! Be quiet! Shush! So, we're going to come around here now. One of the biggest and most important factors when you're dealing with water landing is considering how the plane wants to actually behave. More importantly, if you're landing somewhere you've not landed before, you are going to want to actually do a quick low pass first to assess your landing area. Now, this is especially important in remoter areas where you're not dealing with an actual water runway. Water runways are kept clear. You can treat those to an extent like a normal traffic pattern. However, it pays to be aware. If it's an active air water runway for an, an airport, you're going to be fairly okay. If it is a designated water runway that has access by other vessels, you need to be aware and you will perform a low pass. Now, they can do a number of low passes, which will signal to boats in the area, you are intending to land. So they will steer clear. They'll also should be aware of uh, the fact there's a water runway here and to keep an eye out for aviation traffic. So we're going to come back over the lake here. So here is our runway area. We're going to treat this as though this is an open area with access to other boaters and we're going to try and make sure we know what we're doing. And we also want to do a low pass for a check for obstructions. Now this can be schools of large marine life, like whales, uh, sea lions, seals, dolphins, and more importantly, especially in an area like this, what are all these? Oh, they're trees. What do trees and branches do in storms? They end up falling over and if they're by a lake, they can fall into said lake. So you need to make sure that you have a landing area free of obstructions. If you touch down, you're not going to have a chance to see it. Chances are it'll be just below the surface and it will be a hidden killer. So you need to make sure you actually have got a clear landing area. You won't see every obstruction, but you'll get a good impression if you see something floating. You'll typically see water lapping along the edge of it. So I'm going to make a relatively low pass here and just bring it in over the water. We're going a little fast, but it's just more to prove the point here. So we're checking our landing area, which will be coming in over this point here. So this is going to be our reference point for this for arrival. And I'm going to go out that way. We're to keep an eye out for the sandbar there. 
And of course, looking at the water surface, we're just trying to observe to see if we spot anything. We are a little high up really to do that in this instance, but it lets us check for obstructions and a nice seams in the water there. Thank you. A sobo. That could be a definite thing to hit. We're just going to come across the surface and take a look. I'm not seeing anything major, so we're going to throttle back up and we're going to go around. Nice and simple. Now you have to remember this is quite a draggy aircraft. This will not react like your normal aircraft with wheels because you are dealing with a lot more drag on the airframe. Not just the airframe, you've got these huge ass things sticking out. So the aircraft is not going to be as responsive and I'm going to realize my altitude here is not going to be my biggest fan. I'm going to take a different side for my pattern this time by because I know I'm not going to be able to hold or climb I should say quite as quickly here. So keeping full power on because we are very, very heavy and also very draggy. So we need to be aware of that. Okay, I see terrain. I should come around in time. Watch my speed. We're going to be a little tight here. Okay, I'm good. Go away. Leave me alone. Shut up. No. Actually, what is that button? Shut up. Stupid bitching Betty. I don't care. Yes, I'm aware. This is an important thing. You need to make sure you have physically checked that your landing gear is up. Because, in fact, many planes will have a mirror on the actual struts if they have them, so you can see. Landing with your gear down, we'll flip the plane. Um... Just like landing on land with your gear up can be a problem too, but you're less likely to flip, just damage the crap out of your floats. So we've got our reference point for our approach, which is going to be the headland just down there. So we're going to extend our downwind here, just past these factories, and we're going to come around for our approach. So we're going to configure the aircraft for our approach to the field, and on our way down, I'll talk about some factors here with water approaches. Um, one of those is going to be the surface of the water. You need to be part mariner, part pilot when you're flying aircraft that can land on water. Because you're dealing with two different environments, the environment of the air and the environment of the water. So um, one thing that differs to mariners is you have to be able to judge the distance. When it's very, very calm and there's no wind, you'll get what is called a glassy water effect. And you'll come in at one to 200 feet a minute descent rate there over the body you're landing on because you can't see it till you're super close you will not be able to judge your height over glassy water it's next to impossible so you'll do a glassy water approach at one to two hundred feet per minute final descent once you're below a hundred feet um which helps to just carefully bring you down you'll be configured into a landing attitude with nose slightly high now we're not getting that here but the waves will seem very very far away all of a sudden they'll seem a lot closer so you need to be able to judge that. Now, one of the things that's going to be important is judging wind direction by the wave direction. If you don't have a meter off where you're landing or information, look at the waves. You want to be landing. Obviously, the wind is blowing away from the waves. So the direction they're going in is the direction the wind is blowing. Now, if they're small, yes, yeah, so you can land in that direction. That will be a good idea. But the bigger they get, you're dealing with waves that are coming towards you and you're going to have to be very careful. You won't want to land across the wind, but sometimes downwind can be actually a beneficial choice there because you're dealing with a situation that's going to be I'm off target here, talking too much. You're going to be dealing with a gentler side to the wave, which will upset the aircraft slightly less. So I'm going to configure my flaps here as we hit flap speeds. Bring it past 18 knots. Flaps for landing. Confirm gear is up. And I'm going to just swing around here. My target reference point is there. So I'm going to drop my airspeed to about 65 knots. And let the aircraft sink down here. Coming over the trees. Keep an eye out for any Asobo glitches on the surface, which will cause me trouble. You're always still scanning, of course, for any obstructions in the water, which we don't see. Okay, so it's closed here. We've got good sight on the waves. And I can see it rising up here in front of me. That is ridiculous. 
hold the nose, hold the nose, hold the nose, hold the nose. And we've got an actual weird surface here because of this. And you can get the land reflected, which will change things dramatically. Down we go. Keep the tail, the yoke all the way back here. Keeping the tip of those floats out of the water. Okay, shut up. My gear is up. Be quiet. That is going to trigger the crap out of me. Okay. Water rudders are deployed. So I'm going to pull the flaps in here. I'm going to just turn around. Taxiing to the dock is another factor as well, which is a small factor, but it's definitely one to pay attention to here. Um, you're going to want to basically moderate your speed. It can be tricky to do at first. It will take some practice. But in higher wind conditions, you can actually sail the aircraft, and we'll just demonstrate that as we get to the end. Uh, thankfully, the sim's weather ability lets me actually tweak that quite easily, so kind of a useful feature. It's a fun thing to do, but, you know, because <laughs> your aircraft is a big sail. Look at this thing. Big, flat surfaces. You can sail. So let's keep the tips of my floats nice and high. And I need to choose a body of water that isn't quite as ridiculous as this one. This was actually a terrible example because it's so jank. I mean, look at that. We just went off a ledge. I wish they'd fix this sort of thing. This is really what bothers me. Let's keep ourselves nose high here. How hard is it to get one body of water to the same height? Now, a fast taxi, you can actually get on the step and taxi, which is very difficult to do in a sober with the current water physics is um, where you'll get the aircraft up onto that step and you'll just skim along. You won't pull back, you won't have any flaps configured. Uh, you'll get the aircraft up onto the step, so pull back, accelerate, push forwards, get onto the step. You'll feel it rise up, but keep contact. And you'll just taxi on that. That's a great way to back taxi on water because you can do 40 odd knots. So there's our dock we just left from earlier. So I'm going to put some power in here and help us turn around. And I'm going to moderate my speed. I'm going to pull back on the throttle here. You will glide on water, so it's something to factor in. Let's keep our rudder in here because we still need to keep turning. Okay, there's the jetty. Okay, once I'm pretty positive I'm on heading here, give myself some throttle. Let's keep it easing on in. Bring it around a small amount here. Okay. Don't even need to worry about the yoke at this point in time. In fact, you know what? We're going to come to this side here. It's going to be an easier approach for us. I say that now and I've definitely overshot here with how this will behave. There we go. Now I'm going to want to put some right rudder in. Ooh, Nelly. Brakes don't do anything here, so we're just going to slowly come in, and that's a bump, actually. It's a really fast bump in this case, but guess what? No contact physics, because flight simulator. And we're going to hit a stick. Yeah. Should have actually made that approach more slowly, but you see my point in terms of speed of approach you're going to make there, because whilst that's actually a perfect-ish, we'd, we'd have actually bumped in nice and slow to that bit if it wasn't for the contact portions. Um, it is what it is. Now... Just as a point of proving this, I'm going to drop my gear here. Let's pretend this is actually a boat ramp. Once my gear is confirmed down, it's in transition right now. I'm going to just climb out of the water there and pop, out we are. I am going to get really annoyed at that. Yes, thank you. Shut up. <laughs> You're going to really bother me. But we're out of the water. So you can see what I meant by the gear earlier, with the main gear being about here below your rear strut, about where the Cessna's gear normally is located. And, of course, the nose wheels are very tiny, so you have to be very careful when making those grassy field approaches or something softer. Hopefully this actually provided some useful information. Um, it's all about being slow speed and being careful and making sure you do your checks in terms of departures. It's always about... Keeping the float's nose high initially when you build up speed because you'll create a bow wake as well. That is one thing to factor in. As you initially accelerate, the water will surge out and around the float. So whilst you're basically trying to... and as you, Obviously, not only are you reducing, when you get onto the step, the actual 
length of the float here from this whole bit distance down to this distance you're actually reducing the beam of the float what's the beam the beam is the width so you're reducing it from the full width where it's sinking into the water up there down to a smaller contact area so smaller laterally and smaller lengthwise which means the aircraft will skim more so it's all about factoring in those things and allowing the aircraft to actually do what it wants to managing the physics of moving through a liquid realistically here so hopefully this was helpful thank you very much for watching and hopefully you have some great floaty times out there and i wish someone made scenery that for float planes that was actually contactable a sobo fix your water physics please it is not good but it's the best we have right now <laughs> i've been Alpha angel like the video please it really does help me uh please comment have a chat in there we have a great little community growing and please subscribe if you're not already. Thanks for watching. Bye.